Hello and welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight to explore how we can, as the title suggests, start making great drama that reflects our ecological crisis. I'll be your host for this evening. I'm Natasha Parker, Head of Compassion Not Consumerism at Environmental Charity Global Action Plan, where we work to connect what's good for us and what's good for our planet. And before introducing our incredible lineup of guests tonight, I just want to take a couple of minutes just to set the context of why we're here. So about a year ago, we identified that while documentaries were doing a great job at helping us understand the climate and ecological crisis, drama and entertainment barely mentioned it. Yet they've been, they have an important role to play in cultural change and in firing up our imaginations. So we need to radically change the way we live. We need to rethink the way we eat, the way we travel, the way we work, and everything about the way we consume, as the way we're currently doing it is destroying our living world. We know we need to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 to stop the world from warming above 1.5 degrees. And many of you will have seen on Extinction the Facts recently um, that we've already seen the number of animals on our planet dropped by 60% since just the 1970s. And what we do in the next 10 years is gonna determine the future that we get. And we notice that when dramas depict the future, they almost always depict it as a bleak place where we haven't taken the action we, that we need to. You think of films like Wall-E or Interstellar, where things have got so bad that we actually have to go and live on another planet. We don't believe that we should live on our planet. and We want to see this hope of a planet worth saving and a future worth believing in portrayed on screen. So we got funding from the KR Foundation to take on this enormous challenge. So in collaboration with our patron, Richard Curtis, and many other fantastic supporters, we launched our Flickers of the Future competition, where we called out to young UK filmmakers to reimagine how a sustainable future can be portrayed on our screens. And out of over Hundred submissions, our five talented finalists emerged, and Amy, Bethan, Georgia, Jack and Sophie, who you'll meet tonight, have been getting ready to pitch their ideas to major broadcasters. Our recent survey has told us there's high demand for this type of content, with three quarters of young people telling us they want to see more environmental content in drama programming. So thanks to our partners at RTS and Albert, we're here tonight with an incredible lineup of speakers to explore how we can respond to this call. We'll be first hearing from Britain's favourite filmmaker, Richard Curtis, in conversation with Global Action Plan's Chair, Jeremy Oppenheim. We'll be meeting our final five and hearing what inspired their creative ideas. And finally, we'll be hearing from an incredible panel of guests hosted by environmental journalists and the One Show's green expert, Lucy Siegel, who will be talking to Charlotte Ashby, who's head of production at Carnival Films, Aaron Matthews, Head of Industry Sustainability at BAFTA, Adi Raja, a filmmaker and doctor, John Montague, Director of Comedy at Sky Studios, and GAPS Chair Jeremy Oppenheim will be coming back in to join. I really hope this event will inspire you within your various roles, and we'd love to hear you, how you yourself see yourselves taking on this challenge, and what support we can provide to work with you to create positive visions of the future. And of course, if you'd like to find out more about the amazing creative ideas by your filmmakers, please get in touch. My contact details will be shared at the end of the event. So without further ado, let's meet our first special guest, a man who needs no introduction, Richard Curtis, and in conversation with Jeremy Oppenheim. Jeremy, I hand over to you. So, Natasha, um, thank you so much for the introduction. Richard, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us today and thank you for acting as patron for the uh, the whole Flickers uh, program. Um, it's brilliant to have such a wonderful um, gathering um, on Zoom and, and a particular um, um, sort of um, appreciation for all the young filmmakers, not only those on the, the panel um, and, um, uh, this evening, but also, but also everybody that took part. Absolutely. Richard, um, the, Natasha um, kicked us off brilliantly with the kind of observation that 75% of younger people do want to see more environmental content uh, on their screens. Um, how do you react to that figure? What is it that, that broadcasters need to do? You know, what, how, 
do you kind of uh, take that finding and make it useful? Well, <laughs> look, it's not for me to, um, I, you know, I, I so admire the broadcasters and the commissioners and the range of shows that we see on our TVs. It's always a miracle to me. Um, I just think it's perhaps the moment to realize that we've reached that moment. I mean, what, I, what I've come away from, one of the things I've come away from lockdown thinking is how much things that sort of seemed on the side are now really central to general conversation. I mean, in my house, you know, the big subject during lockdown was the malfunctioning of my mother-in-law's hearing aid. Um, but next to that, it was amazing how many conversations at the dinner table were dominated by arguments about diversity, about racism, about feminism, and about climate. You know, these, they've, they've really threaded into yeah. um, the world that we're living in. And so it's just always to say to people, we're there, we're at that moment where this is, where, where the figure is 70%. Um, where actually it's on people's minds, it's on kids' minds. In some ways, I almost think we've we've not passed the need to educate because that's you know always there. But we did an interesting thing um, the other day. We sort of launched an online thing for my sustainable development goals work, and we gave some gripping facts and gave people the choice of learning more or taking action and everybody is pushing take action. Mm -hmm. They kind of feel as though they know. So in a way, this is a bit the moment for drama to take over. Not that the documentaries aren't all great, and I think they're terribly important, but I think people now feel they know, and this is the moment when drama can sort of demonstrate, exp excite, show the complications, show the action, show the contradictions. I just think that this is a perfect moment to have this and an, and an urgent one. And, and is that, I mean, presumably that's not just for younger people, right? That would be drama that can appeal to all of us. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to sort of think back about my favorite uh, kind of environmental dramas. And, you know, I think the first time I engaged with the issue was Edge of Darkness. Mm -hmm. I loved Erin Brockovich in some ways Chernobyl is a, uh, you know, is an environmental drama. Uh, you know, I remember the China Syndrome. I don't know if you remember that movie with Jack Lemmon and mm -hmm. Jane Fonda, I think it was. So mm -hmm. they've always been there. It's always been a really interesting subject. Uh, and, I, I, you know, by the way, these days, most 10 year olds are as intelligent as most 50 year olds. So. Uh, I, I think that the environment is something they know more about than many of us do. So I don't think we have to talk down to them or make it simple or make it only educational. So, so you know, the, the Chernobyl example is a, is a brilliant one, um, uh, Richard. Um, I think probably many of us that um, were, were absolutely gripped by that, in part as an environmental story, in part as a very human story. Um, in part as a political story, in truth, right? The, the cover-up, right? Um, it, it's characteristic, of course, of many, um, you know, environmental stories with, you know, disaster and maybe a little bit of redemption, maybe not, right? Yeah. Um, do we need to tell the, the environmental story in that way that's always got that kind of, you know, kind of massive problem, right? Um, you know, we're just about to blow up or we're just about to melt down or um, and it's only at the last minute that the hero saves the day. Is that is that the, the, the trope that we need to go with? Or have you seen other people <laughs> telling the story? I don't, I don't think so at all. Um, I think that it's so entered into our culture now that needn't be it. Um, I mean, everyone at the BBC, oddly enough, knows this because I've mentioned it, I think, to six um, controllers of BBC One in turn. Um, you know, the show I'd like to see back is The Good Life. Mm -hmm. The Good Life was a TV program about people trying to do the right thing environmentally and what a struggle it is and how comical it was. Uh, and I do actually think they, there's a sort of ordinariness about the environmental battle, which is now there in our day-to-day in our -day 
uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. So uh, I don't, you know, I've just been writing a, a new animation film and we were trying to think about the characters of the kids and one of them was obsessed by the environment. That would be a yeah. really logical thing for them to do. If you were starting My Family now, one of the kids would definitely be an environmental activist. So I don't think it's at all a thing that can only exist in the world of high politics. I think it just exists in every family. Um, and I also, you know, I was just thinking, because I've been doing a campaign about trying to get people to move into sustainable pensions called yeah. My Money. Yeah. And I was having a conversation with Mark Carney, and he said, one of the biggest risks for businesses now is that they get caught out lying about environmental and ethical behavior. You know, what was it like at Volkswagen when they found out that they cheated on the test? What was it like at Boohoo? What's it like when companies get caught out? What are the boardroom arguments and discussions like? I remember my dad, was offered an MBE, sort of on the condition that his factory stopped polluting the River Mersey. Mm -hmm. And I remember they didn't do it and he didn't get his MBE. But, you know, at every level, in our business lives, in our domestic lives, in our political lives, uh, the environment's entered in as a big old theme. So no, I don't think it always has to be, you know, a nuclear explosion. Right. Now, you're reminding me of Tom and Barbara, right? Which, of course, I think I'm, I'm showing my age at this moment, and, and we're, we're all, we're all becoming fans of allotments and gardening again. Um, yeah, they're, they're a national obsession, full of hatred and competitiveness. I, I assume that the largest cucumber or whatever is, is you know, right up there in the, in the scheme of things. So, so you know, I, I, I think this, this notion of, of making it kind of positive and, and in, engaging is obviously kind of at the heart of what we're trying to explore here. Um, it, do, you, do you go, Richard, look, if we could really get this right, it's almost if, as if the environmental agenda disappears as a separate agenda, but is just woven into drama in the way that, you know, I, I guess gay marriage got woven into EastEnders, or it, how, how does one, how distinct does this need to be as a, a genre of, an, if you will, drama with a heavy green tinge to it versus just everyday drama that brings in more and more of these kind of components? Well, I think that's, you know, sort of empowering for, um, and a necessary thing for people who are commissioning, you know, that just, and it's great anyone who's watching, because in a way they've opened the door and I'm sure they are thinking about this all the time anyway, but, I was just having a discussion before we came on, you know, about how recycling's been in EastEnders and electric cars has been in Emmerdale and stuff like that. So I think it's true that you don't have to see, look, I'll, I'll deal with this issue alone in a whole drama, then I can put it to the side. You know, that's the thing about all things, you know, disability, diversity, all of these things that enter the mainstream, they should be able to be there naturally so it's two questions one have i got a real environmental idea and then two in the ideas that i'm doing you know is there a, a space for an environmental subplot an environmental argument yeah. you know something like that i was just talking the other day to ashling b and she's thinking in the next series of the thing that she's doing that one of them will be obsessed by sustainable investment and that's before i said anything so I, I just think that it's it's there and it's just good for all of us to realize that it's part of the texture of what we're you know all discussing and and worrying about and, and the drama comes when people are fighting against it and even there there's drama in um people who agree i, I mean i tried to get Greta Thunberg's team to join something I was doing for the SDGs, um, which, you know, are meant to fulfill themselves in 2030. And I got the message back, she's not going to do it. She's not going to wait 10 years. Right. Um, so she agreed with everything we were doing, but she just, you know, the, the drama there was that she thought we were being too nice. 
Uh, we have drama in my household on a daily basis as we have battles over, you know, what it really means to recycle the kind of the yogurt pot, right? And is it actually worthwhile doing that or not? Or using more water to clean the thing than and and than than that will ever save in terms of the energy of recycling. So I think that there are so many pieces of everyday life where we're confronted in a way with these questions. Um, yeah, and it's such, a big, you know, it's such a big issue as well. And I think maybe that's one thing we should remind ourselves of how, you know, broad these issues are, that it's, you know, deforestation and forests, it's water, plastics, fish, animals, um you know recycling energy it's a big huge Everything. it doesn't always just have to be a cataclysmic breaking yeah. of the ozone layer as entertaining as that might be but that's another thing that's sort of worth almost having up on your wall you know it's to do yeah. with electric cars it's to do with with pringles packets yeah uh, you know it's it's to do with a lot of things you don't have to look far to for it to come at you. And, and to find the drama in a way. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've got a group of young filmmakers with us um, today. Um, and um, you know, um, I think they would love to hear from you, Richard, some thoughts about, you know, you know, kind of what advice would you offer them if they want to sort of take this agenda, take the, the drama that comes with the shift in our world. Um, and, and bring it to life on the on the screen. What what kind of how 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 do they go about that? Well, you know, I, a couple of things. One, I would say, you know, start as you mean to continue. I mean, my funny career has basically, you know, gone from writing short sketches, and then I used that skill. Mm -hmm. to workers do a sitcom and then I you know mainly you know my films used the same skill I had when I was a sketch writer so if you're interested in the environment start now see whether or not you can make it interesting in a five minute short film you do or in a 10 minute film don't don't put it off don't say well you know when I get my first commission to write a full length film then I'll right, write right. the environment you know I think I think start as you mean continue practice you know, turn out how not to make it eggy, how not to make it embarrassing, how not to make it stick out like a sore thumb in a, you know, in a romance. So I think that's one thing I would say, which is that if it's a big subject with you, see whether or not you can practice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing I think is always my advice to all young filmmakers is look at your own experience and life. You know, you, the big secret of writing is write stuff that's interesting to you and moves you, not stuff that you think people should be interested in. You know, I remember when I started writing on this show called Not That I Got News, mm -hmm. we got given a list of things that were funny, British Rail Sandwiches, trade unions, everything like that. I didn't think any of them were funny. Mm -hmm. So I wrote what I thought was funny. So, you know, look around you and think where the environment is interesting to you rather than educational to you. I mean, I do think it's hugely interesting intergenerationally. Um, you know, when we were thinking again about our money campaign, which is a sort of, in a way, an environmental campaign because we're trying to get investment in renewable energy and all these kind of things, I, I thought of writing this tiny little ad, which was going to be a dad like me telling his daughter who's just started work you must have a pension. You've got to really sort that out, really get yeah. going. Yeah. And then six months later, her coming back to the dad and saying, is your pension ethical or sustainable? You've really got to sort that out. Otherwise, there's no point in me having a pension, you know? And I think the intergenerational yeah. thing is big. I think the relationship between consumers and businesses is big. I think the relationships between people who in businesses who care and don't care is big. I think the relationship in politics between people who want to put it off as a big subject is big. So I, I, all I'd say is take the bits that you find funny about it yourself, the, the interesting arguments you've had, uh, the bit, if you care about animals, take that. You know, so always as a filmmaker, practice 
young, but also I think write what you're passionate about rather than what you think you ought to address. Brilliant. Um, well, I love the way you brought the conversation away from, if you will, nature and the environment standing on its own, right? Which is kind of one way we hold it. And we're not holding it in a kind of apocalyptic way. We hold it kind of in a very abstract, distant way. But what you've described, I think, is the, is the, is the drama and the debate. I mean, you know, at, at least at my home and maybe in yours, Richard, there are you know, five of us and, and everybody wants, some people are a vegan and some people are flexitarian and someone else is still eating fish or whatever. And, and, and it creates a constant drama at, at, at the dining table. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's absolutely right. I mean, the moment has arrived where it's, it's as it were in our bloodstream now. Brilliant. Well, look, I think um, we should um, get the, uh, the, the kind of brilliant five filmmakers uh, up on the screen and get me off the screen and hand over Richard to you to spend a bit of time with them. Okay, that'd be, I mean, not that I want you to go, Jeremy. Yes, but... I know you do want me to go. Let's, let's move it on. And thank you so much again for uh, helping us with this whole program. Not at all. Um, I mean, what I'm going to do now is just have a bit of a chat with each of these um, young filmmakers. So uh, what they've done is they've prepared quite detailed treatments for 30 minute sort of ongoing dramas. And those have been judged uh, as, as the best five. And so what I'd love to do now is just ask each of them to very quickly say before I ask them a question, what their idea is, and then I'll ask you a, a, a follow-up question if that's okay. So, Georgia, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a bit about your idea. Well, my idea is a comedy drama, and it's called Planet B. And the logline I wrote for the idea is, when a hapless young man discovers a planet-sized secret, he tries to juggle two lives, two worlds, and two girls. But can he overcome his indecision and help save the Earth one small step at a time? Oh, that's excellent. Where's it going to be? Where's it sort of going to be set? Is it set in an office and on Mars? On where is it set? It's set in a completely alternative version of the present day. And the main character is out for a walk in London after a terrible job interview. And he has a sort of Alice in Wonderland style encounter where he falls down an underground shaft and uh, finds himself on Planet B. Well, look, let me let me just say to you then. So when you were thinking about it and you thought it, you know, could be could be two girls, as it were. Um, did you find you were kind of pressing yourself to get the environment thing or did the environment thing come as a, as a brilliant way of talking about all the rest of life as well? I'm wondering whether you felt you were cramming two things together or whether putting a sustainable future into your show felt natural to you and how that worked? Yeah, I think so, because one of the things in this whole competition that's been really fascinating for me is that I don't consider myself a sustainability expert whatsoever. So the character that I wanted to see being thrust this chance upon him to, you know, discover an alternate world and how is he going to cope with that? And um, I, I just really, really wanted to see how somebody, basically someone like me, who, you know, I'm a vegetarian, but when my boyfriend cooks sausages, I will go and stand in the kitchen with my head over the pan, just like inhaling it like this because it smells good. You know, people who make mistakes. I want to see how that person deals with coming across a completely new society and the chance to start again and how they handle it. But one of the things as well that I found is that I think casual viewers who aren't really that clued up on environmental content often feel like it's not for them. Um, and I wanted to make sure that it felt accessible for people who aren't experts, who maybe don't consider themselves necessarily even aligned with sustainable values. It's like um, there's that campaign that just happens to be vegan, which, which is supposed to appeal to people who don't consider themselves vegan, but encourage them to make vegan choices. So um, I was just really, really concerned that I create a world that was funny and just basically followed a sort of garbage person 
making their way through life, trying to do the best of it and screwing up, but being allowed to screw up and being allowed to come back again next week and have another crack at it. Well, look, I think that's a really important thing that you don't have to have qualifications. Um, when we were writing a show I did called Blackadder, all we did was read the Lady Bird book of Elizabethan England and then the Lady Bird book. We didn't do any uh, research for it because we didn't want to be mentioning things that meant nothing to normal people. So I think that's a, that's a key thing. Um, and if you had to say your, your film was like anything, is it in, a, is it in if, you, if, you're, if you were pitching it to some ghastly person in Hollywood, would it be this meets this? Well, the, the three little sort of samples I've been using in my, in my work and the treatment I've created for the idea is um, it's The Good Place meets The Truman Show crossed with Thor Ragnarok. So if you can imagine something that <laughs> has elements of all of those, then uh, that's what I'm going for. Well, look, if it's as good as any of those, I think Thor Ragnarok's the best Marvel movie and I think The Truman Show is almost the best movie. So... That's yeah, the bar high. You should be commissioned instantly. Okay, well, look, very good luck. Very good luck with that. Um, I'm moving on to uh, Bethan, is that right? Bethan, hard Bethan. F. Uh, Bethan, do you want to tell us about your um, idea? Yeah, so um, my show's called Keepers, um, and my show explores the eternal question what if beekeepers were sexy? Um, so it's set in a utopic near future where competitive beekeeping has been corrupted and has become this world of opulence and sex and bees. And um, it's an insect oriented romantic comedy where a woman is on the run from a mysterious hunter with only one eye. Um, friends are betrayed and a young man discovers what happens when you realise that you deserve better. Well, it's so interesting because that is again kind of taking just a, a, a mad drama, but then uh, putting, it, putting it in the context of, a, of an ecological, you know, of an, of an ecological question. When people watch your film, which was, or your show, it's definitely gonna get made. Um, when they watch it, how do you think it might change their minds about an environmental issue? I mean, has it got a slightly didactic push in it? Do you want them to come away from it feeling something different, even though they won't necessarily know that was where they were being pushed? Yeah, I think for me, what I wanted to kind of do is to really embrace and look at apathy. So I feel like it's really difficult to care about things at the minute because it's just so bad all the time. And, you know, I really wanted to go, okay, well, let's say that, um, you know, all these kind of bad things that I've been thinking about, um, well, we can never change, you know, capitalism is kind of infinite and forever, and we're just gonna keep voting for our own destruction and all these kind of horrible things that were going on in my head. I was like, right, okay, let's take that. Let's say, sure, that's true. Um, humanities like that will never change. But what if we applied that to environmentally sustainable practices? So that's where the concept of the sexy beekeepers come in. So what I'm kind of really like targeting is people who think, who've kind of given up that things can't change and become apathetic and gone, okay, um, well, let's dissect that, shall we? <laughs> I mean, I think what's so important is that people do just have, you know, more frames of reference on issues. You know, I think about how useful, you know, Yes Minister and the thick of it are, because they mean when you're having a discussion about politics or the West Wing or, you know, all of these things. That's one of the reasons I think for producing these dramas, that it just lets people when they're next having a conversation, when insects next come up, I'm hoping the whole of Britain will talk about your, about your show. Um, next up is Sophie. Sophie, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, your idea? Hi. Um, so my idea is called Cross the Line. And the story is in an alternative zero waste reality. One woman must work together with her alternate self 
to create a greener future before their worlds disappear. And, and what level of, of drama versus other things is it? Is it full of passion and destruction, murder or, or cooking? Well, uh, when you end up in a new world, it's kind of trying, it's all about this girl trying to leave all of her old habits behind, but sort of failing to. But also because there's two worlds and they're essentially able to, to communicate between them, it's, it's a self-conflict of, you know, wanting to do the right thing, but feeling that guilt when you inevitably fail. Right, so it's a sort of it's got a time travel element, except it's not, except it's not time travel quite. Precisely. Um, and and well, by the way, I'm just very interested. How much have you guys um, planned them out? Uh, have you got six times thirty minutes, or have you just done the first thirty? What what what's what does your finished product look like at the moment? Uh, we've got a good overall solid six episode outline of uh, the whole series right it's interesting I mean, by the way my experience of treatments is i always try and put a bit of dialogue in them that that's always my advice so that people understand the texture of it because you learn more about a character from here than say five lines than an endless paragraph saying you know what they look like and what they wear and so tell me what are the key issues that you think, you know, that someone who watches it would come out having a slightly different spin on in terms of the environment? Well, my main thing is waste and how normal waste seems to be in our society these days. So, you know, it used to be that we, we sort of cared about single use plastics and plastic bags and then the pandemic happens and suddenly single use is everywhere and there are masks discarded on the street and something more important always seems to come along and push these environmental issues sort of backwards. And uh, my, I have like a personal contempt for litter bugs and my main character does as well, but that doesn't mean she doesn't waste and it doesn't mean that, you know, she can't leave these sort of wasteful habits behind. And it's kind of laughing almost at like our current reality and you know how we find things normal like the seeping bag of salad at the back of the fridge or that dog poo hanging in a tree you know we're just used to seeing that kind of thing that's trying to yeah laugh at you know how ridiculous all these things sort of are i mean it was one of the things that's giving me optimism at the moment is you know how much covid has shown that things can change fast and uh, I do think that that's one of the things we really have to hope for, that environmental things can change fast. And in some cases, that business can create fast the, the other options. I was interested the other day that when um, David Attenborough was talking to some school kids and they said, what is, do you think the most important issue? And he said waste. In fact, he, he said that the way we consume is the, is, was for him the key thing. So... Um, it's interesting. And, and how do you kind of define that? Waste at every level? Are you thinking about sort of purchase, use, clothes? Yeah, exactly. And in, in, this, new, in this new zero waste reality, there's, you know, what the concept of waste doesn't exist. So there's, you know, there's a use for human fingernails, you know, nothing gets thrown away. There isn't that kind of thing anymore. And it's kind of thinking about what could be possible when waste doesn't exist and that will change on all the levels. That's a really brilliant idea. So that you're actually suggesting behavioral change as well as, as mocking our current, our current behaviors. That yeah. sounds very good indeed. I, 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 I'd be, I'll be traumatized if you don't get a commission um, for that one. Um, Jack, um, the only man here. Hello. Do you think men care less about the environment? And isn't that another reason for finally getting up to equal pay and equal representation? Well, I think female activists are leading the way when it comes to the climate change issue. Like when you look out in the real world beyond what's on screen at the moment, it's activists like Greta Thunberg, uh, Vanessa Nakate, Isra Hersey, they're the ones that are 
out making the speeches and making a difference. So, yeah. That is so interesting. I mean, I wonder whether there is a cultural thing there or whether it's just that women are more intelligent. Um, uh, so tell us about your idea. Yes. So my concept is called Natural Causes and it's a teen comedy drama. Um, it's set in a near future eco-conscious UK where sixth form student Megan gets diagnosed with a terminal illness and decides that she's going to go back through every moment, every choice, every decision she's ever made and completely offset her life. Uh, she enlists a group of friends to help her and she sets off on this seemingly impossible mission to completely erase her carbon footprint from the planet. That is very smart. Do you know, I think the other day Google committed to historic offset, that they were going to not only be carbon zero now, but have been carbon zero uh, throughout. So um, in the show, are they going to, are you going to have any flashbacks to previous crimes as it were, or <laughs> will it all be narrative? Well, it, the way it works is that she draws up this entire list and that literally goes down to sort of like nights out, bad driving lessons, literally every detail is documented. And as she goes back through, you basically get this picture of her life. And I wanted to use the environment as the setup to tell a very personal story. So even though it's the catalyst for the narrative, this sustainable setting, ultimately yeah. it's a way of looking at somebody that's exploring what they've done in the past, the things that they regret, the things that they're proud of, the things they're not. And um, it's just a way of looking at that. So I think what we were saying earlier about actually people want to see personal stories. They don't just want to see disasters and dystopias. I'm hoping that with this concept, it kind of does that. It's, it's framing the environment in mind of just one person's life. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely brilliant. And the, you know, I'm very aware my son's just gone up to, it was so weird. My son went up to Glasgow to university and two days after he arrived, he was the second item on the news because of the fact they'd all been locked down because of the COVID we'll thing. See, yeah. And I, I just sort of feel that they're going to have, your generation are going to have this COVID experience branded on you and i do think that the whole environmental and particularly you know with all the wildfires and floods and all these things it is going to be felt experience rather mm. than kind of learned experience i should care about this because they actually will care about it i mean have you when you watch things that relate to the environment do you think there are big holes? I mean, would you say the big hole is, as it were, it's not entertaining enough and they're all documentaries? What's your sense of the landscape at the moment? Yeah, I mean, there's two there's two major gaps that I see and it kind of, yeah, links into what you're saying. The, the first is actually seeing environmental content in the context of everyday people's lives. Just, I think that thing of turning on the news or watching a film and seeing what's happening it's so overwhelming and it's almost unfair to put that on the younger generation to say right you've now got to sort this out so it would be nice to see um content on screen that says actually here here is environmental issues but presented on a manageable scale on a personal level um and yeah the second thing is actually seeing younger audiences on screen because i think while they're driving the conversation outside in the real world, they're not so much depicted in stories at the moment. I think it tends to be older characters that are at the heart of those narratives. So I kind of want to strike a balance with this story. Um, and I feel like with Natural Causes, the thing that I was really keen to do was first and foremost, create a teen drama that appeals to younger audiences, like um, so they can see themselves back on screen, it just happens to have this environmental twist. No, it sounds great. I mean, it reminds me of High Fidelity. I don't know if you know that, where a guy goes back and he's just about, I think, to make up his mind about who he should spend his life with, but he checks out all his former girlfriends in order to. Um, 
do assure me she doesn't die at the end. There's a mar miracle cure. Well, I can't say, can I? I have to save that. Yeah, well, look, can I give you some advice? <laughs> if you want series two, it's best if the lead character yeah. doesn't, doesn't die a terrible death. <laughs> um, uh, Amy, do you want to tell us about your idea? Oh, you're on, you're on silent. Is it working now? Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Oh, I can't hear you now. I'm here. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I can hear you. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, technical issues. Um, yeah, so my project, uh, it's also a comedy series. Um, I'm so called... thrilled, by the way, that all of you have gone, or, or most of you have gone in that direction, because I, I mean, I would have liked one person to have a bit of depth. But it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's certainly for these commissioners, I think, you know, and anyone who's watching, it shows there's a real instinctive appetite to deal with the issue. So, yeah, do tell us. Yeah, well, um, well it's basically, um, it's uh, set in a rehab facility. So my logline kind of is, if uh, the world was rejuvenated, so where animal products and fossil fuels um, and plastic, they've all sort of been outlawed, um, a misfit minority suffer withdrawal symptoms because I feel like people would, <laughs> you know. Um, so people have dairy addictions, you know, they're fixated with fashion, uh, they're dependent on plastic, um, and basically they have to just rehabilitate themselves. So they're, they're all these ecologically challenged people move in together um, and get therapy, and it's not plain sailing at all. That is, and it's all going to be set there. And have you thought of it? What kind of texture is it? Is it drama, or is it nearly? Is it when comedy? What would? What's it like? Is it like fresh meat, or is it like Miranda, like, or is it like what's it? What's it like? Yeah, it's it's more sort of um comedy drama territory. So you know, sort of Channel 4's Feel Good, or um, you know, um, Ashleen B's um comedy series on Channel Four this way up it's kind of that sort of texture so it's basically people just wanting to feel happy and normal in a world that kind of flummoxes them to be honest um so yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of what i where i was going because it's a world that's changing and we're basically going to be watching people you know change but in a way that that people would if they were sort of faced with a with a situation that is kind of out of the ordinary um, and you think it's going to make people resist environmental change because they don't want to go to rehab um, because they eat so much bacon. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I mean, it, the the idea for that kind of came quite personally for me because um, I've I've kind of I've been to rehab before. Um, so you know, um, I I find that it's this notion of kind of it, of getting better that kind of it should be incorporated into sort of environmental programming because yeah. our impulses nowadays, I mean, a lot of them are destructive, you know, um, they're, they're not good for us really, or the planet or, because, you know, if we've only got 12 years left, um, it's not, the, it's not the, uh, the best scenario for the world. So um, yeah, I just thought maybe using comedy or using comedy drama, we kind of have the capability to present a realistic world that is recognizable but also kind of slightly reformulated is it um, slightly in the future or is it now as this as if this had happened 10 years ago it's basically yeah like an alternative now so um instead of maybe thatcher getting in yeah. the green party got in changed changed society as we know it um and yeah people just kind of haven't haven't adjusted quite as well as they probably should do well, um, so yeah backstreet burgers <laughs> contraband cars <laughs> all that jazz um i really yeah i mean god some of the people <laughs> who i know if they weren't allowed to think about cars um they <laughs> hardly think at all um yeah. uh look all i can say is this is this has been a real surprise to me hearing your five ideas i'm now glad i hadn't done any homework because the way that you've all come at it is so, you know, idiosyncratic, based on the things that you kind of know about and experience, being amused by the subject. It really has given me a sort of vision of how 
you might switch on the telly and realize, and which I think is one of um, the things that we need, that you can't get away from it now, that it's everywhere and not that it's finger wagging and only the responsibility of politicians, but it's something that you're all engaged in, in a kind of imaginative, amused, you know, basically very benign way. And I, I really do hope that, I, I think for anyone watching, they will have thought, oh, great. So it's, I mean, David Attenborough can't live forever. Someone's got to take over the mantle. So uh, I think that it's, it, that's been really brilliant, all of you working these things through. I hope they all happen. And I think they will have given people a real vision of how it doesn't all have to be nuclear explosion, that the range of environmental programming could be really wide, doesn't have to be boring, doesn't have to be didactic, doesn't have to be terrifying, but in fact could be funny, interesting, educational, personal. So very good luck to all of you. Um, and I hope, as I say, that um, it'll give me something to do during the next lockdown um, when I get to watch all your shows. Thank you all very much indeed. And now, with any luck, Natasha is going to pop up and tell us what to do. Natasha, did, did we do okay? Yeah, you did brilliantly. Thank you. I can't thank you all enough. Richard, thank you for being the patron of the project and for your time today. And a wonderful, wonderful filmmakers. Thank you for applying our, our crazy competition that we just put out there. We had no idea what we were going to get. And we're so glad that we found you and your wonderful Great. idea. So just thank you so much. We'll, we'll let you go now, Richard. Thank you so much. Well done, all of you. That's, it's really been an exciting conversation. Very good to meet you all. <laughs> okay, well, um, after this, this exciting introduction to all these amazing ideas, we're now going to move on to meet our expert panel, um, which is going to be moderated by the wonderful Lucy Siegel, who uh, many of you will know from um, The One Show. She's the green expert on The One Show. Um, she's also uh, an environmental journalist. Um, she's written books about how fashion and plastic are, are the, all the problems that are caused by them. And she also hosts uh, a fantastically named podcast called so hot right now, uh, where she recently interviewed David Attenborough. Um, so welcome, Lucy. Um, thank you thank so you. much for joining us. Um, and just before before you go on to interview our, our other panelists, we just wanted we'd love to hear from you for a few seconds, just about you know what what does this mean to you? You've been uh, you know broadcaster bringing uh, non factual you know environmental programming to our screens for quite a while now. What does it well, mean? you for the, the stepping up of the drama and comedy brigade well my my um output is supposed to be factual <laughs> um so um yeah i have been accused of being non-factual a lot actually so i i primarily work on tv in a sort of hybrid weirdness called factual entertainment which i think was set up to annoy everybody that 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 phrase but I am a passionate consumer of uh, drama and TV, um, particularly soap operas, as I'm sure we'll learn throughout this, um, throughout this discussion we're about to have, because I'm always name dropping Coronation Street and the fact that I got to go to the set a couple of years ago and see what they were doing to be greener. I think for me, I, and the, one of the reasons why myself and Tom Mustill, who is my co-host on So Hot Right Now, why we started that podcast was because we met at the Frontline Club, which is a journalist's uh, club in Paddington before lockdown. And um, that's really normally for war correspondents. And we felt so we were aware through research that had been done by global witness which is an amazing uh, environmental organization with the frontline club that more um, environmental journalists 
were dying in the field uh, reporting on stories than ever before um, uh, and they come second only to war correspondents in terms of risk and danger so that was our motivation because we felt that climate um, and nature was not being covered enough at that time on the news channel of course by the time news channels by the time we get to air our podcast of course there's been all sorts of schemes about increasing climate and nature coverage in news. I still don't think there's enough. However, what we quickly found ourselves talking about on So Hot Right Now was talking to amazing people like Lisa Holdsworth, from, um, uh, who's uh, head of the UK Screenwriters Guild at the moment, and, and the capacity for drama. And we've just heard all these wonderful, amazing ideas uh, I'm glad they were all about comedy and to having that sort of um, analysis from Richard Curtis. Wow, that was so brilliant. I really, really enjoyed that session. And it just is like everyone's saying, the time is now to do this. We know that most people get their climate information from television. At the moment, they mainly get it from news. I still think they're being underserved and I think there's bias by omission, which is maybe a whole different thing. So we came to our podcast sort of in rage and feeling like we were being pushed out. I have really struggled to get um, stuff. I can, I can do things on plastic and plastic in car tires all day long, but you know what? We need to move the debate on. We really, really do need to move the conversation on. And everyone is saying now is the time. Someone said to me the other day that if um, China makes good on its uh, promise to, uh, peak emissions at um, 2030 and then be net zero by 2060. If Trump loses the election, so the US gets back on board, Joe Biden's quite strong climate policy or climate talk, and then um, the EU pushes ahead with uh, the Green New Deal and net zero and UK net zero, we could create a different world in one career cycle. So someone explained it to me, Justin Bieber, if he was to continue touring as long as Bob Dylan is touring now, he would be touring in a net zero world. Some people may think that's a terrible thing that Justin Bieber would still be touring. But anyway, it's just to tell you about the time frame. This will happen really quick. And if it will shift very quickly, you started this conversation, Natasha, tonight, talking about how we need to get better at articulating the future that we want. You know, we need to see it. We need to describe it. We need to have dramas about it. And we're going to look pretty stupid if we haven't made any drama or content about it, aren't we, when that happens? So that's where I am at. Shall I, in shall I introduce the panel? I shall leave you to it, Lucy. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm very excited. I don't want to see Justin Bieber in uh, 40, 50 years' time, but uh, I would like to see him in a net zero world. Um, so oh, yeah. we'll, we'll forgive him. Um, okay, I shall leave you to introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, it's so brilliant that you're all still watching. What a turnout. Thank you. I hope we can keep you to the end of the session. So we've got a mandate for this panel. How can drama and entertainment commissioners respond to the call from young people for more environmental content? You know, you're saying you want it. I'm suggesting that the audience is predominantly young. I, d I can't see you. But anyway, let me introduce you to our brilliant panel. Um, and then we will crack on with trying to answer that question. I'll get rid of that bit of paper. It is not relevant. So, good evening. When I when I talk about you, can you give us a wave, please, panelists? Let's start with you, um, Aaron Matthews, head of head of sustainability at Albert, which is uh, BAFTA's um, uh, green bit, basically. Um, it says in my notes that Aaron is a, an environmental consultant with ten years' experience supporting the screen industries. That doesn't even be become start to cover it he's caused a revolution he's constantly constantly at tv production companies indies or the big networks constantly infusing them i don't think you badger people i think you would infuse them into submission anyway you know so much about um 
what we need to do and what we are doing. So thank you for being here this evening. Um, Charlotte, let's come to you. Give us a wave. Charlotte is head of production at Carnival Film and Television, producers of Downton Abbey, Belgravia, The Last Kingdom, Stanley's Lucky Man, and much, much more, much, much more. Um, Charlotte is known to, and, and loved by so many of us. Um, she's also on the, the Green is Universal Committee and is working with Sky to embed sustainable practices in production. With you on our side, how can we fail, Charlotte? Thank you, thank you for joining us. You heard from Jeremy. Jeremy Oppenheim, give us a wave, hello. You heard from him and that brilliant conversation with Richard Curtis. Um, Jeremy is the chair of Global Action Plan. Thank you for, um, for making this happen in so many different ways um, and knows more about the environment and how we are going to achieve system shift and how we're gonna uh, achieve that net zero world than anyone on the planet, so thank you. Um, John, John Montague, thank you for joining us. Director of Comedy for Sky Studios. Such a long, distinguished, brilliant career. He's been involved with just about everything funny that you've ever seen. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, and he's going, to, he's going to tell us more about himself as we go along. Addy, Dr. Ad, Addy Raja, thank you so much for being here. You probably know Addy already, but he's an award-winning film producer and an NHS doctor. I don't really know how you manage to combine those things, but it is, come on, it's heroic, isn't it? Frontline clinician and creative storyteller. You're, I think, self-taught in film, not in medicine, and I think that's the right way round. But we will talk more about that because I also think that's really, really interesting. Um, your film, Samaritan, is currently circulating the film festival, festival circuit, it says here. Um, I hope we get, all get to see it as well. But let's crack on so we can actually hear you guys speak so that I can shut up. Okay, Charlotte, I'm going to come to you first. Um, what more can be done, do you think, to get broadcasters and production? and the production community to pick up this challenge of making positive, sustainable content for our screens. Thank you, Lucy. Well, what Global Action Plan has done with this Flickr's initiative is a fantastic step. We've all been so excited to hear about these projects and those of us who have been working with them have absolutely loved the process. And most of all, it's about good ideas and good storytelling. Just as the HBO comedy series Six Feet Under broke a taboo and tackled the topic of death head on and with humour, it will take the right stories in the right hands to make content that tackles this issue that audiences want to watch. But we know there are real challenges. The market is saturated with projects and many of us producers are going to face making less content now than ever before. And in that busy market, producers and broadcasters are looking for loud, impactful, distinctive content. Finding stories with an environmental angle that will meet that brief is quite challenging. To tell a positive story of a sustainable future, you need to work hard to find an angle, a source of conflict, drama or jeopardy. Nevertheless, we know we're living in extraordinary times and we know our decisions are crucial and will have huge consequences. Then it's so hard to understand why this context doesn't already permeate and frame our narratives, fictional as well as factual. And the impacts of climate change profoundly affect people around the world and here in the UK. And the fact that there are so few sources of inspiration about a future we might want to make happen only reinforces our inability to confront today's environmental crisis and to take action to affect change. And yet these young writers have managed it. And I think it's by telling personal, relatable stories that confront, but at the same time entertain with irreverence and humour. And just as Richard has already said, hopefully one of these stories will break through and become a mainstream hit. And then no doubt we'll all be falling over, over ourselves to make more shows in that vein. 
So we need to nurture young writers as well as encouraging seasoned writers. And we want broadcasters, broadcasters to see this as part of a commitment to a journey to net zero as Sky is doing and I'm sure John will talk about in a minute. And to avoid promoting and celebrating polluting resource intensive behaviours and acknowledge that these behaviours harm others and treat them as we have done harassment and discrimination. I'm sure Aaron will pick up that subject as that's I know something dear to his heart. And we as producers need to produce our content on an ever more sustainable basis. And I'm personally working um, with, with Aaron and Sky on that. And we as an audience need positive visions. I know I do. We all need to want something different before we're willing to move on from what we have. And the research commissioned by GAP that we've already talked about young audiences expecting environmental issues reflected in TV drama. Well, we need to listen to that in order to capture that elusive demographic um, and commission dramas that cover this subject. COVID will of course change what writers want to write, what producers want to produce and what broadcasters want to air. It's too soon to tell how, but the pandemic is a wake up about our relationship with the natural environment, about our society and who's valued in society and the importance of resilience in our systems. And there's been a collective awakening to our local communities, the value of green space, of nature, birdsong and air quality. And this will make it into mainstream entertainment because we have great writers and producers and directors who will want to explore these new perceptions. How many times have we said to ourselves, if we'd seen a TV drama on our screen last year where a leader like Boris instructed the nation to go into lockdown, shutting down businesses, borrowing and paying out billions to do so, we would have read into it all sorts of metaphors. Given that reality has now overtaken drama and metaphor, we're definitely gonna need some new ones. Wow, Thanks, Lucy. thank you. <laughs> Reality has overtaken drama and metaphor. What a position to be in. Oh my goodness. By the way, I forgot to say, please, can you ask us some questions uh, to our brilliant panel? Just, um, you just need to pop them in the Q&A box in time on a tradition and we will come to those. Don't be shy. Okay, we're going to come to you, Aaron. Where are we starting to see this content included in drama and comedy programming could you direct us to anything that's kind of working and you can also spotlight things that you think are coming up like where are we going to start seeing it if if we are indeed if we are i don't know i wish i had a crystal ball to, to let us know thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this panel it's, it's great to great to be part of it um I, I, don't, I know a lot of what we do is is research the industry and see how it's doing, you know, because the role of broadcasting is to hold up a mirror to society to see how it's doing. Well, the first step has to be to hold up a mirror to ourselves to see how, how we're doing. And that's something that we've tried to do um, through subtitle analysis. Uh, we did it last year with a report called Subtitles to Save the World. And we showed that across a whole year's worth of broadcasting content. BBC, ITV, Channel 4 and Sky together mentioned climate change 3,000 times, which is the same as urine and zombies. Um, so we're just about to put out a, the, an updated report. It should be here already, but amazingly, the analysts who are working on it have also been working on the NHS Track and Trace app. So it's slightly, it's slightly delayed. Anyway, what the, what, the, what the research shows is that climate change is now talked about four times more than it was the previous year. But that's put it on a par with discos and bikinis. So what does it say to an industry of public service broadcasters who talk about um, bikinis just as much as they, as they do climate change, especially for an industry who have it in their lifeblood really to talk about contemporary issues? So to answer your question, you know, we've seen some great stuff already. Um, 
we in, especially in, in continuing drama like you said coronation street emma, um, emma dale and, and eastenders too have done some great stuff i also thought it was really interesting to see climate change just running as a theme throughout michaela cole's i may destroy you you know is, is we're, we're getting there but there are a handful of instances really aren't they they're just kind of su such small little things that probably won't even show up on our analysis in a, in a meaningful way when what we need to do is explode kind of into into every genre not just drama but re reflect the reality that we that we all find ourselves in i guess that's the question isn't it how we found ourselves in this position and i guess it's i guess it's being part of a broadcasting chain where news is you know part of the part of the conversation and I think we're dealing with a hangover really of kind of impartiality over accuracy that we had in the news you know we've got over that hurdle now but we're still dealing with climate change as a difficult issue um to, to grapple with when i speak to a lot of commissioning editors about climate change they think i've gone there to, to talk about recycling their scripts rather than their opportunity to speak with their audiences about the biggest issue on on the planet so i think it's you know what, what is clear when we do speak to people it is this human stories that connect with people you know we're not going to win this with with parts per million it's um, it's the human stories which 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 ring through and that's why i really enjoyed listening to our five winners about the human stories where, where climate wasn't actually the, the main theme but it packed a punch certainly thanks Aaron. were you and um, when you listened to the to the to the five before and you heard their stories and there's such it, it, their their pictures and their sort of incredible fleshed out detail i mean you've thought about this a lot over the years you know this is completely your beat you've been agitating for change for a long time were you what was your impression of of their of of the work that they've done and their ideas yeah, I, I guess the, the first thing to say is that I'm not a program maker. I'm just someone who's been observing this and getting more irritated over over time. Um, I think what they did really well is strike the balance with climate change being not in the foreground and not in the background as a, a, a kind of a major theme because if it's too front forward people turn off they, they don't like it but if it's too far back it's, it's meaningless as well you know we all grew up with the wombles and look where we find ourselves <laughs> you know it can't be it can't just be in the background as a theme that rumbles on that isn't integral to the plot so what they've done amazingly is woven it in to be a core part of the narrative but it's not a narrative about climate change it's a narrative about beekeepers or you know you know jeopardy rather than narrative about climate change okay thank you um i would like to confess that i'm joining you from surbiton which is where the good life was set and it's had a massive massive impact on my life but there we are uh, that dates me as well um addy we're going to come to you um, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about um the role of tv in relation to mental health and the environmental crisis as well um, what role do you think that tv can play for example in reducing eco anxiety do you think it has a role in that yes well i think uh, yeah mental health and the environmental crisis are very closely interlinked um, i think on the surface you can see the impact of that so with mental health you can see depression you can see anxiety you can see suicide with climate change you can see the impact on the weather with the floodings and, and the wildfires but obviously underneath that i think there's a lot of uh, different factors, a lot of layers of uh, sort of biopsychosocial entities that are sort of leading up to that. So I think it's important to think about all those kind of things in terms of like social inequality, diversity, discrimination, politics, economy, lots of things that we've touched on today. So those I think are sort of societies that kind of bring mental health and the environmental crisis together. So putting on my doctor hats, I'd say probably the environmental crisis and the mental health crisis are the two biggest healthcare crises we face at the moment. They're both getting worse. Um, you know, as a frontline doctor, I've seen the impact of mental health and particularly during COVID, it's been obviously a very troubling time and continues to be a troubling time. And I think we're going to see a lot of mental health incidences continue to rise. Um, we know that suicide is the biggest killer of, of men under 35. Um, and so I think, you know, these are actual things that we need to address and they are healthcare crises. You know, the, the World Health Organization has estimated an extra quarter of a million deaths from uh, climate change over the next two decades. Um, 
And I think particularly with the younger generation, I think this is a generation who are very connected with the world um, through social media, through the internet. And I think there's maybe a, a feeling of, of hopelessness and feeling disenfranchised. This is a, a generation that wants to change things and sometimes doesn't feel like that's happening from the top. And I think when you look on screen, you look on TV, it's often a dark dystopian future. And I think, uh, you know, that kind of drives the anxiety further and kind of causes this kind of eco anxiety. And I think the important thing to state is we're all kind of in this together. So for example, in mental health, we have, we, we say something along the lines of we all have mental health. So mental health is not a separate entity that some people suffer with. We all have mental health and we're all on a spectrum. It's just that some people have slightly better mental health than others, and that can vary over time. And I think similarly, I think we all have climate health. We, we all have some, we're all part of the climate, we're all part of the world. And I think, you know, for some people, they're, they're suffering more than others, but it's, it's something that we're all coming together with. So I think that's kind of what we need to see on screen. So answering your second question, I think, well, well the easy answer is I think you should commission these, these five programs that we've seen today. They sound amazing, um, and that will probably solve most of the issues. But um, I think it comes down to, I think what, what we want is a sense of escapism. You know, we want a sense of, 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 of you know, hoping for the future. You know, I, I sort of suffered with a bit of mental health myself through medical school. And one of the most uh, useful things that I did was I, I watched Scrubs. So Scrubs was also highly popular in the 90s and it's a great combination between comedy and drama. And for me, that was a, had a real big impact on me as a sort of young doctor growing up and, and suffering with depression. Um, so I think, you know, you can use drama, you can use fiction to have an impact in that way. You know, we've talked about documentaries and we've talked about how, um, you know, we can use data and facts, but I think essentially you need to connect with the audience and you need to connect with their emotions through a narrative. Um, and you can have an impact too with fiction. Um, an, an example I often use is, yeah, you know, before COVID, we had another pandemic and that was social isolation in the elderly. And, and one of the biggest public health impact things that we had was actually the John Lewis adverts. If you remember, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, there was a, a two minute video on Man of the Moon and there's an, a sort of isolated man on the moon. Um, and that was a combination, that was a program that was done with Age UK and actually had a massive impact in that sector. So I think fiction has, has a big role to play. I think we need to see more positivity on screen, more diversity. If you want to connect with a diverse audience, you have to have diversity on screen. Um, and I think it's our, uh, it's our sort of responsibility as artists and commissioners of artists to really show people what sort of community we need moving forward. Okay, thank you, Eddie. What a smart way to think of it as a mental health and climate and your climate health and, you know, like the financial markets, it can go up, it can go down. So yeah, we shouldn't take anything for granted. Thank you for that. Um, we are running out of time as always. So I'm going to keep this brief uh, and I'd love to be able to take some questions. Um, I'm going to come to you, Jeremy, if that's okay. How important do you think this emerging relationship is between the environmental sector, of which you are very much a part of, and the creative sector, of which you're also part of, I guess? Lucy, um, I, I think um, you know the answer to this, which is, of course, that it's so critical. Right? And we're all so influenced day in, day out by what we see, what we watch. You know, we are, as, as I was describing to the panelists earlier, it turns out that, you know, you know our brain is tuned right, to visual cues, right? 65% of our brain works on visual cues, right? Um, and so, you know, creating drama, creating um, forms of visual um, uh, expression and media are going to be absolutely key to what we need to do, which is to win hearts and minds. Um, the environmental movement has been stunningly good at telling us, um, if you want to listen, about the, the disaster that is playing out, right? The slow train wreck, right? This is slow onset climate disaster, but it turns out to be quicker than people thought. Um, we're brilliant at explaining. I mean, even listening to the language that we've been using, we always talk about the environmental crisis, or we have language about extinction. Um, so our language is tuned into, you know, a bleak, high-risk 
fearful set of assumptions. And no wonder, Addy, you know, the kind of um, the climate stories and the mental health kind of are probably highly correlated with each other. I mean, um, I'm told in the, I think it was the 13th or 14th century when, when people really did think it was going to be the end of the world, that it, you know, that, that there was a development of a state of melancholy. Uh, that whole, and there were whole books and a whole genre of, of melancholic monks meandering around, just sort of waiting for the end, right? Um, now, as an environmental movement, our greatest skill has been to tell this bleak and you know, terrifying future. We, we intersperse that with a very abstract um, kind of alternative proposition, which is, you know, please love nature, but, but almost viewing it kind of independently of choices that we make in our own lives. So that nature sort of held out there in some, if you will, distanced way um, as something that we observe, but isn't in fact something to which we actually have a direct relationship. And so, so we're desperately in need of the creative sector to, to turn this on its head and to tell the stories about the future that we need to build together. Um, don't rely on the environmental movement to do that it won't get there, right? So we act, it's not like it would be nice to have the creative sector, right? You know, that'd be cool if they could just chip in a little bit, right? It's an, a hundred percent imperative that over the next decade, when we talk about the decade of action, which we love talking about in the environmental movement, this has got to be the decade in which it is whole of society that engages, that it isn't just, if you will, the kind of people who are terrified or the people who are ultra activist. It has to be whole of society. And that is why we need the creative movement to be right in the middle, right? I mean, I'd love, I mean, at some level, I mean, I'm gonna ex make the extreme statement, which I don't fully believe, but I'll make it anyway, which is, you know, we, we win when we no longer have an environmental movement. Right? When you no longer say to me, Jeremy, you're a sort of leader in the environmental movement, because everybody's in that movement, right? Um, now, you know, that's where we've got to go, right? To make this something that everybody's in, right? And that I can actually stop being regarded as someone who knows a lot about net zero. What a terrible thing to you know more about net zero than God knows, right? I mean, right? On the on the tombstone. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, but that, that's that's what we that's where we've got to get to, and we cannot do it within the environmental movement. I'm convinced of that, and we have to get the very best of the creative world to engage. Okay, I think that I I, I agree with you. Don't leave it to us. It's not going to end well. Okay, Jeremy, thank you for your honesty um, uh, uh, and um, your clarity. Now we're going to come to the commissioner. It's all on you now, John. You've heard what everyone's got to say. All arrows are pointing in your direction. I think, <laughs> was it Addy or Aaron said, why don't you just commission the five that we've just seen? Um, what um, what criteria do you use and what, what are you looking for? How can we help you and you help us? Well, I mean, I think the first thing that I would say is that um, my employer, Sky, um, I think culturally are, are kind of industry leaders in terms of this, this whole debate. You know, I mean, in, in, you know, we... Um, we uh, we we've committed to go car carbon neutral by by 2030, which is which is 10, uh, 20 years ahead of the government's commitment. You know, uh, we're founder members of the Albert um, uh, the the, uh, the Albert certification. Um, there's no single use plastics. I mean, you know, Sky is very vocal about its commitment um, to these issues, and I think that um, culturally that's really important. You know, in terms of us acting as a beacon to the rest of the in industry and in all genre, actually. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that um, 
we won't work with partners who don't share those values that we have and clearly you know uh, our values around the environment are, are very strong so so uh, but but even even granular stuff like uh you know how the sky q box uses electricity more efficiently you know how taxis that serve sky um should be electric all, all those kinds of things there's a whole piece about it and i think that's um I think that as an employee there, I think that's really, really, impre really impressive. And I think that, that, that percolates down to the, to the editorial, you know, and, and I guess um, that, that's the bit I'm here to speak about. I noticed this is called um, making a drama out of a crisis. As Richard Curtis will tell you, comedy is a far higher art than drama. Uh, drama, you just simply have to tell a story. In comedy, as I'm sure our four, five competition winners would, um, would agree, you, you, you have to tell a story and make people laugh. That, that's considerably... More difficult, but um, and I'm, it's a shame Richard isn't here to back me up because I'm sure he would. Um, you know, editorially, we in comedy we want to surprise our audience. We want to, you know, really deliver the best sort of comedy that we possibly that we, that we possibly can. And um, we know that um, Sky subscribers love comedy. We know that they kind of expect it. And you know, I, it was interesting that um, also something Richard said earlier about. Um, you know, uh, diversity and disability uh, and, and, and elements like that entering the mainstream. I think, you know, I, I hope that we're, we're seeing a period where, you know, there's a there's a kind of hygiene factor around these sorts of issues, really. Um, I, I, you know, I, I loved um, I, I loved The Good Life um, and I love The Wombles as well, by the way. Um, but that probably shows my age. But um, yeah, I, I think I think that you know, where I sit, um, that there are lots of, of, you know, I'm seeing evidence, but but I guess, you know, I'm seeing evidence of stuff in, in our shows where the, the issue is, is tackled on a kind of granular, real, you know, level. And, and I think one of the things we look at with scripts um, in comedy at Sky when we go to commission them is we, we ask the question, why now? Why would we do this script now? Why would we do this show now? And if And if there isn't a compelling answer to that, then we probably won't commission it, right? And, and and when you when you think about the contemporary world and the nowness of things, you know, everybody is committed to 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 you know being an environmentalist and and, and not being irresponsible with 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 the planet actually. So, um, so so I think we're beginning to kind of see some of that percolate through and. Um, you know, uh, again, Chernobyl's talked about earlier. It's, it's great show, Sky show. You know, often we, uh, it's not one of my shows, it's a drama, but often we're obsessed with the second series or a returning series or, 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 or the life of a series. And clearly, thankfully, happily, Chernobyl's gonna not, not going to get a series too, right? <laughs> um, so, so but, 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 in, but in comedy, and also I would say, um, you know, there's some really impressive ideas from, from, from the five finalists. And, um, and, and I think we just have to be alive to actually what, stories are, are, are younger you know younger writers telling and, and how are they telling them um, uh, and, I, and I think you know I, I kind of feel positive about it really because I, I think you know the, the values and the principles are in place at Sky it, across all genre you know we you know Sky News is, is, is and Sky Nature as channels Sky documentaries those sorts of places are more uh, I guess more overt in their in their storytelling with um, with environmental issues, but um, but I think you, you know I think that we uh, we're seeing more of it in, in scripted comedy and and for example we do a show called Breeders with Martin Freeman which um, and Daisy Haggard uh, which is written by Simon Blackwell and um, the show um, if you haven't seen it shame on you but the show is is really about the trials and tribulations of being a parent of a young family being parents of a young family and there's a scene in it that that sprung to my mind when i was asked to do this in which um in which uh, paul martin freeman's character is kind of being driven to alcohol really by the demands of parenting okay and um uh, and the bin men come round, the, 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 the recycling bin men come round and they kind of take him to one side and they say, look, we've noticed how many bottles of wine you have in your recycling. We noticed how many bottles of whiskey are going on and like, we've been there. We, we, we're here to help, you know, we're kind of all this kind of de facto um, impromptu support group. Um, and it struck me that, you know, Paul may be a desperate alcoholic, 
but at, at least is an environmentally friendly um, desperate alcoholic who recycles, uh, you know, his 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 um, his, his bottles. So, you know, I, I see a lot of that. Ramesh Ranganathan uh, was in a show with us called uh, Reluctant Landlord, and um, you know, Ramesh, as in real life, uh, the character in the show is, is a vegan, right? So a lot of the a lot of his character was informed by his veganism. And actually, uh, I think it was um, Georgia that mentioned smelling her, this is gonna sound really wrong, smelling her boyfriend's sausages, you know what I mean, um, as a vegetarian. Um, you know, a lot of the comedy actually in, in, in Ramesh's show was about veganism. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, I think comedy in particular relies on big targets, right? And it relies on taking down big targets. and. Um, and what better a target than, you know, an anti-environmentalism, I think. And, um, you know, I'm reading a script just, just earlier today where we've got a show in development and there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's an argument between two friends because one of the friends wants to buy a diesel car and the diesel car, because it's cheaper, um, and, and, and the jokes sort of come from targeting him for being so short-sighted because actually what... It's cheaper in the long run, but it's more expensive. It's cheaper in the short term, but more expensive in the long run. So, you know, we, I think we're seeing more of this kind of uh, uh, nuance in the fabric of, of some of our comedy content. And I think, you know, were a show, um, were a show such as The Good Life or, or something more, more um, overtly a, a, a around our event, environmental issues to come around, then um, we would absolutely do it. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Do we need quotas though? Because we're still really not putting enough stuff out there. I mean, we reviewed um, when we were making a, an episode about this, we reviewed the, the 70s and there was, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but a very famous US sitcom, um, which, which basically did all the stuff about the ozone layer and got it out to a mainstream audience in a, you know, in a really profound way. Do we need quotas so we're getting more than 3,000 mentions per year of climate uh, crisis? Um, that's a big question. I mean, uh, you know, I think, I think in, scripted, in scripted, in drama and in comedy, I, I think you have to really... I, one of the, I think it was Jack, um, Jack uh, Stanley, that one of the finalists said that he started um, with the... You know, you know, he didn't sort of set out to write to write an environmentally campaigning uh, uh, show, but that's just that's just a hygiene factor in it. That was just what was coming from his brain, really. And I think, really, what we want to what, what we've always wanted to do is is engage the best storytellers, in our case, the funniest, you know, who who who've got who who've got the best ideas, really. And I think, rather perhaps than quotas, that I think these issues and these kind of stories that are very personal to some of our writers today um, will emerge kind of more organically perhaps. Okay thank you. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of questions really quickly because we're sort of almost um, on time. No one stopped me, told me to shut up so I'm going to keep going. Um, Addy, we have a question for you. Um, oh, people just saying you're amazing generally. Um, uh, okay, there was a question as well about how you split your time. So how on earth um, well, I just think quickly, can you tell us why you were compelled to become a filmmaker? Like, why did you feel like that was a thing that needed to happen? And how do you sort of manage your time with being a doctor? Uh, well, you don't really, so I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but um, I, I started out as a doctor and I think, um, you know, I think there's a, I think things are changing, obviously. and. Uh, the NHS is changing and I think you, you're seeing a younger generation of doctors who want to do more than just be on the front line. So they want to sort of be entrepreneurs, they want to get involved in, in leadership and that kind of thing. And I, I mean, I think I, I personally went through a bit of a mental health crisis essentially. And I think the best thing to do after a crisis is to do something different. And I sort of took a break and realized I always wanted to make films, I always wanted to story tell. Um, and then that's when I sort of, you know, the light bulb sparked. I was like, yep, yeah, okay, let's just do it. So I'm sort of half and half now and I sort of focus more on stories kind of linked to healthcare as a USP, um, you know, before I sort of think about branching out. So yeah, I'm still figuring it out. There's a bit of an untrodden path, so I don't quite know how to do it. 
Okay, thank you. You are amazing. Right, I just want to ask, I'm just going to do a round of this question, starting with you, Charlotte. I can't now find the question, but there was one and they called Richard Pete. So Richard slash Pete had said that when they, when they asked people, did they want more education or did they want action? They all wanted action. And someone asked us a question saying, well, how can we deliver that action in, in what we do in creating, producing dramas in the, in the creative industries, when a lot of that action really is about structural change. Sorry, I know it's quite a complex question, but it's an interesting one. How do you, how do you deliver and help with that shift and impact? It's a complicated question. Um, how do we deliver action? I guess it, it's about, I think, you know, what those finalists have done is to engage us in a story that makes us want to listen and get involved and personalises it. I think once we take the big mega issues down to a personal level it allows us as individuals to find our spark to find our way of dealing with it and processing and therefore taking action so I think that it, the more people that take action in their own personal lives in their work um, and us as producers and broadcasters and people within the creative industries, the more that we um, promote these voices, then the more we are likely to affect system change. Because systems don't exist um, independently of humans. Humans create, make, <laughs> manage systems. These are man-made. I mean, ap apart from, of course, the natural world, but I think here we're talking about human systems. So, um, I think those systems really it is about affecting individual change and drama um, and the creative industries as a whole has a role to play in that. Okay, thank you. Very good point. Aaron, do you have, could you add anything onto that? I'll just get to repeat the question once. I was struggling with a crying baby in the background, hence the bags under my eyes. If we could get the question one more time, that would be very, I forgot, very helpful. you're a new father. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Um, yes, it was a really complicated question. So, and I also can't find the question, but it was basically talking back to what Richard was saying when he offered people uh, the opportunity, did they want more education about these issues or did they want action? Did they want to, to act on them? They said action how can the question was how can we if you're making drama or you're in the creative industries how can you give people that like those action points when a lot of them are about structural change i think it's a really tricky thing to balance but i think the most important thing is to make sure that the actions are the right ones you know in my conversations with commissioning editors i am always bewildered by the fact that they don't know the relative importance of food type over um, f food miles or electricity. They think we're going to recycle our way out of climate change. There's a really bewildering lack of information when you speak to commissioning editors about, I'm bewildered by their, their lack of understanding of the climate crisis. And that's not because they're bad people. You know, the whole industry is just very, very, very busy. So I don't mind how we find them, where we find them, ways to do it, whether they're the major storylines or a, th a throwaway line. But what they have to be is completely tied to the science in terms of the actions that we need to see and once we agree what those are then it doesn't really matter where they are <laughs> they can live in the background at the forefront but they have to be the out the ones that the climate needs to see okay so we had a question on exactly that issue how we tie these to the science like where do you even if from a writer's point of view from a producer's point of view this is complex stuff how and a lot of people are put off by how do they check it all how do they source it all you know this is not news so uh, how do we, where do they go and how do we do that? I mean, the easiest way is just to measure your carbon footprint. WWF have got a great carbon calculator for individuals and that's a great place to start. You know, Richard Curtis says you don't need to be an expert on this, you just have to have your own, your own experience in it. So as long as you measure your own carbon footprint then you can speak with confidence about your own position and you don't have to come at the point of an environmental activist, but even 
meeting the conflict on screen is very interesting. If, if you're not ready to show the actions, just addressing the conflict is a great place to be, I think. John, do you feel clued up enough about climate science to commission on it? Well, as I said earlier, I'm 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 very um, uh, you know I'm I'm very uh, a part of the Sky culture, and I, I I slightly disagree with Aaron. I think that you know Sky, uh, the the commissions at Sky anyway, in my, in, in my experience, are you know very aligned to those values that Sky have published. You know, in terms of of, of their of their intent for the you know, for, for, for the future and how, and how Sky would, would tackle it as a business. And like I say, you know, we don't engage with any independent production companies who don't share those values. So, you know, um, I, I think um, obviously we all need to get a lot better. Um, we are all busy, I think. But I think there's, a, there's absolutely a tacit understanding of the seriousness and the importance of it within, within the circles I work at, at Sky. Um, you know, I wouldn't pretend that I'm an absolute expert on it, um, but 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 we talk about it, you know, on a daily basis, and we, and we talk about it, um, you, you know, all all the time actually, and uh, uh, and so you know, I I think it's getting better. You know, I don't I don't think it's fixed or solved, but I think it's improving from where I see it. Jeremy, could we help? You're the king of net zero, as I've announced you as. So, I mean, could you could you do some special um, uh, uh, training or information for harassed and overworked commissioning editors? Um, uh, yes, is the answer. Um, but look, I, I mean, I think um, a couple of things. One is there are some pretty good resources available, and you know. Um, John, anybody, if you think that this, you, you need access, then just literally will will help, right? Um, but um, you know, I, I I also think we can make this reasonably easy, right? I mean, there's a there's a new campaign that Richard and a number of us are involved with um, that is about you know ten simple actions, right? That that everybody could do. Right, that would make a huge difference, and does it solve everything? I mean, you, you know, I think the, that original question, Lucy, was you know, big systemic stuff and all the rest of it. Well, yeah, it is big systemic stuff, and at the same time, switching to clean energy, you know, switch to valve, switch to somebody. Right, you know, um, there's a bunch of things that are relatively straightforward that don't require you to be a climate scientist. Um, and that, you know, if they were repeated and consistently, you know, threaded through, you know, everything that goes on, then, and, and you know, if there's a cheat sheet and people need it, we'll put it together, right? Um, it's, it's that simple. Um, just ask him. Just ask him. He'll do you a cheat sheet. That's such a, that's such a great uh, offer. I can't tell you. Listen, I'm really sorry, but we are going to have to come to a close because we've run over time. We had loads and loads of questions. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know how, but we should harvest them, Global Action Plan, and we should answer them. Um, just to, um, Aaron, would you just tell everybody how they can get in touch with, um, with um, Albert and just where they can get information on what you do yes yeah, so our website is uh, www.wearealbert.org and on there i can see there was a question around production sustainability as well so half of our website is all around production sustainability the other half is called planet placement and it's all about editorial how to weave the planet into your programming so that's that's our website and you can drop us an email we you know we run free training for the industry too so all the information is there and I would say that I think like collaboratively, we are all together in this. And, you know, the more that we can come together and push, like Jeremy was saying, you know, if you need a cheat sheet, if you need, you know, whatever you need, we are really, really up for supplying the environmental back knowledge, whatever you need, because we need to see this shift. So thank you. Um, and I want to say thank you again to the um, five filmmakers that we heard from before, because that was just kind of electrifying. And thank you to um, our brilliant panellists, to Charlotte, to Aaron, to Abby, to Jeremy and to John. And Natasha, I'm going to hand back to you if this is still working. It is. It's still working. Am I? Good, you can see me. Um, 
Oh man, well, an absolutely fascinating conversation and I can't thank you all enough. Thank you, Lucy, for being such a fantastic moderator tonight. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, we could have taken this conversation on a lot, lot longer and we, we had so many questions. I'm so sorry to all the audience members. It was impossible for us to answer them all. We have harvested them. Um, we will take them away and we will do our best to get you some answers. We hope you've gone away feeling very inspired after this evening. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the, the session, if you'd like to get in touch with us, um, my email is up on the screen right now. You're uh, very welcome to get in touch with us and uh, find out how we can support you with uh, thinking about sustainable uh, narratives in your dramas and comedies. Um, and also, um, if you'd like to you know, hear more from our five finalists and their ideas, again, please get in touch. Um, they're ready to get out there and start pitching. Um, so if you want to snap them up, get in touch quick. Um, and just thank you to everyone. Uh, it's been such a fabulous event and we hope you will uh, all go away and do something different in your lives as a result.